Welcome back to Outside the System. In this episode, I spoke with Chris Newby, the author of Bitten, The Secret History of Lyme Disease and Biological Weapons. You may be skeptical about the premise of this book, but I promise there's a lot more here than a baseless conspiracy theory. Chris has top-tier technical credentials and spent a large chunk of her career at Stanford. Much of her book is based on primary research, most of which involved Freedom of Information Act requests and interviews with individuals directly involved in the biological weapons program. Most importantly, her work shows the tragedy of Lyme disease in the medical system isn't some movie-like conspiracy, but instead mostly made up of good people operating under bad incentives. I've linked to a lot of material in the show notes, so check those out if you're inclined to dig deeper. If you enjoy this episode, make sure you pick up a copy of the book. A share on social or review on Spotify or Apple is also super helpful in spreading the word. And if you're getting value from outside the system, you can also support us financially on the Fountain Podcast Player app or any other podcast app that supports podcasting 2.0. Let's get into the episode. Chris, thanks so much for joining me on Outside the System today. Thanks for the invite, Neil. I'm glad you found my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually, it's a good, uh, good starting point. I'm not even 100 percent sure how I found it. Um, I must have been Twitter or so, seen it posted somewhere and uh, caught my attention for for sure. Uh, this is a topic that I was interested in because I know some people who've been personally affected by Lyme disease, and I think the bigger questions that your book raises were also just super interesting. So I bought it immediately and uh, have been raving about it to people that I've met ever since. So must have had in the last week, I must have had like five separate conversations about about your book. Uh, That's amazing. So, yeah, appreciate you. Uh, appreciate you writing it. Um, so before we we dive into the the uh, the book specifically, I think one thing that I was personally, um, I, I found really intriguing about the book just right off the get go. And when when you just even go into the intro, is that this is not just like some abstract, abstract topic that you're talking about and just researching from a third party standpoint, it's something that has deeply affected you personally. Um, so I'd love to just maybe start off with that personal story. Uh, just so uh, those listening can be, you know, kind of get that that sort of overall picture of, of how this topic and you were brought to this topic, really. Um, and then we can dive into you know all the great uh, things in the book. Sure, uh, Lyme disease became my favorite disease in 2002 when my family went to Martha's Vineyard for a beach vacation, and we came back to California, and my husband and I became sicker than we'd ever been before. Uh, about a week after the vacation, and uh, so. My my kids were not sick, but my husband and I one Sunday night looked at each other and says, I think, I think we're dying. You know, this is the sickest we've ever been. And we both went to the doctor together and they said, oh, it's just a summer flu. Go away. Um, come back in three weeks if you're still sick. But a week later, we thought this is horrible. And it, it was just the worst flu we've ever had. Probably felt similar to COVID, which I've had several times. Um, and... So this began our journey into the medical abyss. We pretty much thought, well, America has the best medical system ever, but uh, it took us a year, 10 doctors and $60,000 to finally get diagnosed with two tick-borne diseases. That's Lyme disease and a former cattle parasite called babesiosis, which is a lot like malaria. Along the way, every, all of the, 10 doctors, I said, well, we went to Martha's Vineyard. That was the number two state for Lyme disease. Here are our symptoms. Do you think this is Lyme disease? And there was a litany of excuses. Well, that's a rare disease. For you and your husband to get Lyme disease on the same vacation would be like winning the lottery. Uh, one chief of infectious diseases at our local clinic said, well, I think you have a psychosomatic couple's disease. That was his exact wording. And, you know, your husband's a successful Silicon Valley exec, and uh, we think you're just seeking attention, and he's having sympathy pains. And by the, eight months into the disease, both of us were secretly thinking we were dying because 
every organ system was affected. Um, GI issues, uh, joint issues. My husband, who's product designer, couldn't pick up a drill or a pen, pencil or a pen. Uh, he would be at a presentation at his company and he'd be at the whiteboard and he'd forget where he is and what he was talking about. And he would have to cover. Uh, I stopped working. The worst part of it was the brain fog. So we had such bad brain inflammation, our executive functions were completely disabled. I would leave my car and leave my engine open. I would be driving and I'd forget what the traffic lights meant. What does green, yellow, and red mean? I mean, it was just basic. And then to have, just to go from specialist to specialist. And long story short, finally we got the last doctor at Stanford to test us for Lyme disease and it came up positive. And he said, well, those tests are really bad and I don't believe them and we're going to fire you as patients. Later, I got to know that uh, professor and he said, well, our depart- our infectious disease department doesn't believe in chronic Lyme. So here we had a system that misdiagnosed the disease. And then when it became chronic, they wouldn't treat us. So, you know, then I'm an engineer by training. I have two engineering degrees, one from Stanford. And I said, well, I can fix this. This is this is simply a disease of ignorance. And if I put out the proper information, things will be fixed. Well, I was wrong. And once I got well enough to sort of work, I teamed up with a document, a, a, a filmmaker, Andy Abrahams in Sausalito, who was also starting a, a Lyme disease film. So we worked together for three and a half years and um, produce Under Our Skin. It's a documentary you can still watch online for nothing or next to nothing. Uh, And that was when my eyes were really opened. It was the first documentary to show the patient experience for these crazy mixed tick-borne diseases. And um, that's when I realized how big the problem was. It wasn't that California just didn't understand Lyme disease. It was a nationwide problem that was being systematically ignored in that film, I went into sort of the corruption of the the medical system, like how there could be, not that doctors are all corrupt, but how there could be a, um, a false paradigm for what this disease is, an oversimplification. Uh, so, th- so anyways, that's how I realized the size of the problem. Um, but once I finished the documentary, it launched at Tribeca, and then it went, it was on the Oscar shortlist the top 15 in 2010. But after that, it was a five-year process. You know, I'm done. I got a really good science writing job at Stanford. And I said, well, I'm moving on with my life. So (laughs) then something happened. (laughs) Do you have any questions before I go on? (laughs) Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I have many questions, uh, some of which were, I mean, we're definitely going to touch on all of them. Um, Would love for you to continue telling the story. But before we do that, would love to maybe take one step back for for I know a lot of people know people or personally have been affected by Lyme disease, but what is Lyme disease? That's you know maybe let's yeah, level set there. Of course. Yep. So Lyme disease is um, a bacteria, fairly complicated in the bacterial world, more chromosomes than almost any other bacteria. It's corkscrew shape, which makes it really effective at drilling through any tissue in your body. Uh, but it is transmitted by a tick bites. So ticks who've been perfecting the skill of getting a blood meal for millions of years, you know, drills into your skin and the way it pulls in blood is it's a bellows. And so whatever infections it has in its gut are transmitted into your body. And this Lyme, Lyme disease, also called Borrelia burgdorferi, is one of 20 different pathogens that we know of that can be transmitted by a tick bite. And I would say it's a, um, it was this virulent ver, um, variation of Borrelia's was first documented in the late sixties around Lyme, Lyme, <clears throat> Lyme, Connecticut, which is um, on the coast of Connecticut, uh, right across Long Island Sound across from Plum Island, which is a biological test, was a biological test center. Um, And 
very close to New York City. Yep. So. And the name and Lyme disease, I guess, gets its name not I mean Lyme from Lyme, Connecticut, right? But uh, also the 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 uh, uh, would you say like the scientific name like Willy Bergdorfer, right? Was the was the, we have many questions about him, which we will get to in the story. But um, yeah, that's where I, did, I didn't realize that that's actually the name of the the bacterial species. Yes. So the scientist Willy Bergdorfer was called in when this crisis happened around the New York metropolitan area, of Connecticut, New Jersey. Uh, Rhode and this Island. is back in the sixties, right? This well, is in the sixties. Well, well, there's the hidden history, which is covered in my book, buddy. Yes. People in that area knew something was up. Willy Bergdorfer was the tick specialist of the U.S. who was called in when the people at Yale and the public health departments couldn't figure out what was making people sick. And he's a tick specialist. By then, they suspected it was something in the ticks. And he's the one that in 1981 identified the spirochete. And later on, it was he was named after it. Or the, it was named after him. It was named. He also said, yep. I wish they never named it after me, but that's, you'll find out why later. <laughs> yep. Um, okay. So now what happened then after 2010? Because this book wasn't published then until uh, 2019. So what yep. happened in the in the interim to bring you back uh, to the topic? So the launching of the documentary was exhausting, especially when I was still recovering. I I was taking oral antibiotics to cure it. And uh, what finally got me over to permanently carrying it was intravenous antibiotics because the organism likes to go into protected spaces like your brain, uh, immune protected spaces. So I find that finally killed the bugs in my brain. So anyways, I got this job at Stanford. I remember two weeks after the launch of the, or the film, I, was, I said to my husband, I'm done with Lyme disease. I've given my pound of flesh was very emotional um, and I'm going to like put it, all this disease stuff behind me. But she, the two weeks after I said that to my husband, I went to a birthday party in Texas and it was a family party. And there was only like two, one or two people who weren't part of the family. And this guy was a little bit sloshed at the kitchen table. There's a bunch of people sitting around. I said, Oh, what did you do? You know, before you retired. And he says, I, I worked for the com the company, you know, it's the, dark side of the CIA. And turns out he had been more or less an assassin during the Vietnam war. And, uh, he, he told some tales. We were all riveted and wide eyed. And then the last thing he said was, well, the strangest thing I ever did was drop two boxes of infected ticks on the Cuban sugarcane workers. So this is during the cold war 62, um, they were trying to destroy Fidel Castro in any way they could. And they had this thing called the Cuba project and it was also called operation Longos. And there was just dozens of ideas they had to destroy Fidel Castro and his economy. And so that was pretty shocking, but I found it was impossible to prove because nothing had been published at that time on the things he, he talked about. And, during that evening, I would run to the bathroom and <laughs> take notes on what he said, because at that time I didn't knew nothing about the Cold War. I knew very little about the Bay of Pigs fiasco and all this stuff. So that was that was well and good. And then a filmmaker that I just casually knew called me up just a couple weeks later after that and said, I just your book or your film inspired me. And I just drove. 32 hours straight and interviewed Willie Bergdorfer, who was the discovery of Lyme disease. And he admitted that he believed that the thing that was making people sick in the Lyme Connecticut area was a bioweapon that his lab had worked on. So was, at that point, it's like, Oh, I really want to move on, but this is too good of a story. And it's just a crime against humanity because we have this unchecked infection raging across the eastern seaboard now it's spread even more and you know i'm i was <laughs> i i was pretty well equipped 
with my background in the film. So that started a five-year process of writing Bitten, which was Bitten, the secret history of Lyme disease and biological weapons. So that's how that started. Yeah. Well, the story of dropping the ticks on Cuba was really interesting. And then you have a section in the book. We're skipping ahead a little bit, but I'm fine doing that right now. Um, the, there was another story of how the U.S. government did a, uh, they dropped mosquitoes on, I think I have my notes, Savannah, Georgia, and or like near Savannah, Georgia, and some somewhere in Florida. Uh, to, and they said they were not infected, which they probably weren't, but it's, it is a, like, it's kind of, I don't know, as a lay person, right? I hadn't researched the space before. Uh, I didn't know anything about this program. It was like, I didn't even know that the U.S. government did experience. Like, I think we all know about like the nuclear, you know, tests and all like that whole program. That's what gets a lot of the attention. I didn't even realize there was this whole biological weapons program uh, at all until I read your book. And then I started Googling more about it. And I was like, oh, wow, there's a whole lot of stuff that happened, which is kind of not talked about anymore. And arguably potentially you know more dangerous in many ways and with more unintended consequences potentially than even nukes um so anyway that was i thought that was fascinating it, it, maybe let's touch on that story a little bit just the 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 whole biological weapons program uh not specific to lyme disease but just overall the work that was happening um in the u.s during the cold war yeah, after World War II, the Russians and the Americans split up the German scientists. We took a bunch of um, Japanese and Germans who were in the biological weapons program and the rocket program and uh, under our wing. And Willy Bergdorfer was brought over from the German-speaking part of Switzerland in 1951 when that whole program was fully funded. And his, part of his job was to translate all the secrets from the German bioweapons people who worked under Himmler. So, and he was a tick expert uh, in Basel, Switzerland. So that's one reason he was hired into the biological weapons program immediately. Um, so, uh, w- well, so the, the biological weapons program was centered in Fort Diedrich, Maryland, which is about an hour out of D.C., and a certain arm of that was the Bugborn Weapons Program. And the idea behind that was um, we take bugs, they're actually arthropods, eight-legged, fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. We stuff them with dangerous pathogens, and then we drop them or dump them um, on our enemies. And what that happens is it makes people sick. They won't know what did it. There's no fingerprints on ticks or mosquitoes that you can take, find. And it weakens the general population. It ties up the medical resources. And then when we go in with our, our big guns, it'll be easier to take over the, the country or the region. So the, this program was competing for funding with the nuclear program. It was pretty much considered a poor man's nuke, effective in stealth. And uh, they, so it was just as secretive as the Manhattan Project. And after World War II, there wasn't a lot of specialist biologists, zoologists, entomologists. So they raided the universities and they, were, they had 50 universities complicit in this program, but they would compartmentalize the projects. They didn't know what they're doing. But the, mm. the main efforts and um, with the entomological warfare program is uh, they had fleas and they were stuffing fleas with the plague, the <laughs> badass germ that wiped out Europe's almost wiped out Europe several times. And um, mosquitoes, they had they got a dead person's liver from Trinidad and it had this deadly Trinidad uh virus in it and they stuffed that they they fed mosquitoes on that and then there were ticks and willie was in charge of the the tick explorations so you can see on my website chrisnewby.com i have pictures of they would take ticks and press them into plasticine clay and then willie would make very thin pipettes and stuff the pipettes in the ticks mouths and then pour 
slurries of horrible diseases in their mouth, and they would take those ticks and put them on, and diseases would stick and work in mammals, and he would measure the lethal dose of the organism. So Willie was stuffing uh, diseases like rabies, Venezuelan equine encephalitis, um, which is an incapacitating disease, tularemia, which is really deadly, and um, leptospirosis, leptospirosis, which is like a, another Borrelia-like spirochete. So that that's what he was doing. Now, um, that was sort of in the 50s and early 60s. After a while, the military people thought, well, this is this is hard to do, controlling two living systems so that you could package it so it could be delivered reliably by an enlisted person. So back to what you're saying about mosquitoes. They did pilot studies. So Willie would do sort of, on those organisms, do feasibility studies. Then they would do pilot studies. So one of the pilot studies was they took these mosquitoes. Um, they didn't have... And we're talking about millions of mosquitoes. Right. And they didn't have uh, the live agents in them, but they just wanted to see if we drop these mosquitoes from a plane or whatever, how far would they spread over what period of time? Because that would be important for wartime. So they created this whole fake operation where uh, military people dressed up as public health people would put mosquito traps around they wear little white jackets then they drop the mosquitoes on poor black neighborhoods in georgia and florida then they would go knocking on the door oh any um, unusual amounts of mosquito bites etc so that was one study another study was with fleas and that so the mosquito operation is called big buzz which is very cute <laughs> uh, big itch was done in the utah desert about 60 miles from Salt Lake City. And they had a big test grid and they put guinea pigs in cages all around the circles. And then they dropped some almost 200,000 fleas, also uninfected because this is just a pilot study on the desert floor. And then Tex ran out and collected the guinea pigs and counted how many fleas were on the guinea pigs. Again, to see the spread. <laughs> so these, but the, you know, the problem is they're releasing non-native organisms in an area. For example, the mosquitoes in Georgia were Anestheles mosquitoes, Egypt, Egypti. They're from Egypt originally. They're tropical mosquitoes that carry things like dengue and Zika. So you're upsetting the ecosystem. And that has long-term repercu repercussions. So, and so I call there... it the American Chernobyl because... We as humans think we can control uh, organisms like GMO mosquitoes, but we really can't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, well, and they're so small. Like, how do you control for for, for their spread? Um, yeah, the mosquito one was eye-opening to me. And then wasn't there another uh, experiment that was done uh, as part of this program, I think in the Utah area, that could have been catastrophic, but was not. It was like a near miss. They worked on a lot of things in Utah. Tick-borne tularemia. They had some experiments with that. Tularemia uh, spread by ticks, but when they moved to just mass-producing germs without the insects, which was in the late 60s, tularemia and anthrax could be mass produced as organisms in big stainless steel bags. Like you'd brew beer, you know, you put mm. live bacteria and uh, growth medium food for the bacteria. And then they would freeze dry the bacteria and mill them with other things to make a certain particle size. So then they could blow them across city area size. That was project 112. You can Google that. So there were a bunch of pilot studies on that, not using anthrax and tularemia, for example, in the Pennsylvania Turnpike tunnels. They did a study in the New York City subway system. So they filled a Lyme bacteria, but it wasn't, they thought it was not disease causing. And they, they smashed the light bulb 
on the grates that go on the sidewalks that go down into the subways and the particles whoosh, you know, there's a vacuum when the subways go down. The particles basically spread in a day throughout the entire subway system. And they predict the analysts from the military predicted it would have infected pretty much everyone in uh, wow. New York city. And the re they did that study so they could go back to Congress and say, see in a closed door meeting, we're very vulnerable, and that's why you need to give us more money to study it. There was also one in San Francisco using a live bacteria that was a simulant of anthrax, and they took Navy ships and cruised them back and forth across the opening of the San Francisco Bay. Same thing. It would have infected a huge population. And in that case, it was a bacteria called Serratia, and um, it did kill some people. You know, wow. Wow. The army tests were the, with healthy young soldiers, not with the old representative men population. Who had, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's so interesting how uh, the incentives here are kind of, and that, I mean, we're going to touch back on incentives throughout this conversation, but the incentives, even for these military programs, are kind of perverse because they're fighting for funding. But to get the funding, they have to show the need. And to show the need, you have to show that you're vulnerable, which requires showing you're vulnerable <laughs> and that uh, creates some very weird incentives where these types of experiments happen. Um, the, 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 the thing I was referring to actually in Utah, I just checked my notes. It was actually not a biological weapons test. It was a chemical weapons experiment, the VX nerve gas um, that killed the uh, flock of sheep, I think. Um, yeah, but it could have been 6,000 yeah. give or take. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was, um, uh, a nerve gas accident. They were they were testing a new nozzle out of a high performance jet. Uh, there was adverse. A weather front was coming through, and the nerve gas got blown over two valleys over, very very close to the capital city of Salt Lake. Yeah, and the thing the thing about that accident, it. They had done about 1,200 nerve gas accidents on the Utah desert at that point. And that was just the one where they got caught. <laughs> and then there's mm. this whole thing about the cover-up, too. Oh, well, what's the thing about the cover-up? I actually didn't get into that. Yeah, well, well that's what, what my there? next book is about. So. <laughs> oh, all right. If we we're going we're gonna to have to tease that. Yeah, I, I'd love to get into that. Um, but I think this is probably a good, uh, as good of a time as any. Um, I would love to now talk about uh, the 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 whole, essentially, the premise of the book, or, or one of the main points that you touch on in the book, which is the bioweapon theory of Lyme disease. So, I guess this is probably was uncovered through your research, and obviously, it sounds like there was even some firsthand, and this was covered in the book as well, firsthand conversations with uh, with Willie uh, Bergdorfer, and. Would love for you to now just touch on like how uh like like how did you arrive from thinking, okay, this is this horrible disease that's spreading throughout, particularly the East Coast, um, to this is a you know, an offshoot or Chernobyl, you know, America's Chernobyl essentially, um, of of a of a biological weapons experiment gone gone wrong. Yeah. So Willie, by the time I interviewed him for the film and then later on for the book he was in his eighties and he was very compromised with Parkinson's disease, which he believed was caused by the Lyme disease that he got from having rabbit urine splash in his eyes. And mm. I got his workers comp uh, file. So yeah, he got Lyme disease and he believes that's what his Parkinson's was caused by. Um, but so, Wait a minute. What was your exact question? I have about yeah. 10 so what is the things. yeah? So what is the biological weapons theory of Lyme disease? Oh, okay. um, and then yeah. and then also your your like I guess journey from just researching the disease to uh, I think where the book you know kind of points to, which is that this is America's Chernobyl. Yeah. So there's the public facing story where you know, Yale and public health investigated this mysterious outbreak uh, around New York City for about 10 years, and they couldn't figure it out. Willie's the great NIH hero. He analyzes the ticks and the blood and says, oh, I have discovered this new spirochete bacteria 
uh, and no one else has ever found it before me. And I'm, you know, I'm a hero and age is hero. This mystery is solved. So that's the public facing story. But with my book, what I did is I went backwards and said, okay, you know, how do our public health people know if something is a biological weapons attack or is it a, um, you know, just a natural occurring thing? So uh, one of the things is unusual animal die offs. So I went through the old newspapers and found out, yeah, there was a lot of animal die offs from the late 60s, which is the height of the biological weapons program of highly unusual organisms, some of them first in man. So the thing I realized is there are really five unnatural organisms that just showed up at that time. And some of them, you know, were being in the process of being weaponized. The bioweapons program officially stopped in 72. But so late 60s, we had this new thing they call Lyme disease, Lyme arthritis. Then there was this First in man cattle parasite, which is called Babesia. It's the red blood cell infection I got. And, you know, it's right near Plum Island, which was America's anti animal bioweapons research facility, just a few miles across the Long Island Sound. And then there was <clears throat> um, Unusual outbreak of Rocky Mountain spotted fever all along Long Island. Rocky Mountain spotted fever is the most deadly tick-borne disease. Usually Long Island would have one or two cases from people who had traveled out of the area. But during the late 60s, early 70s, it was just like a lot of people dying. There's a map of the cases on my web of all the cases and just hundreds of people coming down with it. So three tick-borne diseases, Rocky Mountain spotted fever was weaponized, Babesia, we don't know if it came from Plum Island, and then this unusual Lyme disease. Now, Borrelias had been around since we'd see the Iceman, but this was a particularly brilliant one with strange symptoms like swollen knees and this brain fog. And then there are also two other organisms that I discovered afterwards, which was Venezuelan equine encephalitis, which we know was weaponized and um, duck plague, which could have come from Plum Island. So if you're a sentry, if you're a specialist looking for a biowarfare attack, that many organisms in that small area would be suspicious. But when Willie announced the discovery of this, he told me in confidence later when I was researching the book that, you know what, when I analyze all the ticks and all the bloods of the people around Lyme, Connecticut, there actually weren't spirochetes in all the samples, but there were there was this other organism which is very close to Rocky Mountain spotted fever, the deadly bacteria. But I was told to cover it up. Now he's an old guy, so I have to confirm what he says. So later on I came across he was trying to donate all his lab papers to a Utah University. And I got an early sneak peek of that. And I saw his original discovery article on a yellow pad where he had mentioned this mysterious other organism, which was unidentified, maybe engineered, we don't know. Uh, and it, uh, he, I called, I labeled it Swiss agent because yep. in the middle of this investigation, and he's in charge of it. He's the chief of the Rickettsias of the United States. He says, I want to take a sabbatical to Switzerland, <laughs> you know, in the middle of the investigation before Lyme had been identified, and he goes to Switzerland. He intensely collects 4,000 ticks. He ships them back to his lab in Montana, and they develop a test. He discovers this other mysterious rickettsia there, which he calls the Swiss agent, which later will be named by him Rickettsia helvetica, after the Swiss goddess of war. You know? So <laughs> he, he tests all these bloods from the Connecticut area, and they're all positive for Swiss agent. But that, he said, they someone, and he would not name who, said, you need to sweep that under the rug. Let's have Burley Bergdorferi be the fall guy, the misdirection from these other things that could be a biological weapon. So that's the premise of my book. Uh, I have documentation, and uh, Willie's, you know, semi-confession he was a reluctant whistleblower i would say 
But he had the most to lose by saying something like that. Because in science, if you have an alternative theory, you talk about that in the discussion section. And if you don't, it's scientific fraud, really. And in the long run, science is always right. So someone will figure out what this mysterious Swiss agent USA is, I hope. Was the, uh, or sorry, what is this misdirection, this, you know, potentially labeling, you know, get, having a fall guy for, for Lyme disease, is it, that tied to why it's so hard to test for? Like why so many people continue to, you know, like in your case where, you know, you were even telling the doctor that this is something that I, you know, I, I think I have, and they're telling you it's psychosomatic. There's, there's some scandal associated with the reference sample of that bacteria that is used for every test kit. The, the history on that is there, that's most of the test kits. I mean, I haven't checked lately if this is true, but are just based on one Long Island strain from Shelter Island called B31. And that was brewed in lab so that, Reference sample that all the Lyme tests are done against is not wild type, what's in the wilds. Plus, you have the complication of Borrelia burgdorferi is highly mutagenic. It has so many chromosomes that it's a shapeshifter. I mean, if you think about it, it lives in lizards and raccoons and voles and people and, uh, and in ticks. So it's very adaptable. Even when it's in your body, it adapts. So we have a t- one strain and it's adapting in your body. It might not pick up that. There, as it moves across the U.S., it picks up other, it mutates. So it's it almost seemed to me a purposely <laughs> misleading test. There's also a complication in that around the time Lyme was discovered, the laws in our country changed so that people at the CDC and universities could become partners with pharma. So they could look at this new organism, exciting. I could be the next Jonas Salk and develop a vaccine for it. They can look in their microscopes and identify surface proteins on that and patent it. So this organism has evolved over millions and millions of years. They just identify the protein sequences of that surface protein and patent it. And then they can make money on the test kits or the vaccines based on it. This was at the time it was discovered. The laws have shifted a little bit. So so the incentive structure had changed again. <laughs> right. So well-meaning scientists who were playing the scientific game, science builds on itself. And most of the initial discoveries are wrong, but then it's fact-checked by other scientists. And Science moves really fast this way, especially with the internet. But what happened is all of a sudden, this small group of researchers in that area teamed with Big Pharma. And Big Pharma says, well, hey, we have a competitive advantage now. You identified the surface protein. We're going to use it in all these products and keep that secret. And so then, you know, it takes 10 years or more to develop a vaccine. And science grinds to a halt. What's more... This group of scientists who just happened to be there weren't the brightest bulbs, I think. And the science on the underlying foundation was wrong for everything we know about Lyme disease. And then they were it was complicated by uh, financial stuff because these initial discussed scientists um, were in on the vaccine profits. So they patented tests that only worked with the vaccines they were running the clinical trials at a thousand bucks a patient, so they were in on that. They were invested in making everything seem a okay. So the incentive structure, and we saw that with COVID and the COVID vaccine, which is just rolling out now. But I always say Lyme disease was the prequel to the COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Read that yeah, to understand the- what's happening now. Yeah, I mean that actually it, your book did actually illuminate some of the ways that uh because something that really struck me um both during COVID I think but also as, like reading your book made it more clear is it would be one thing if the Lyme disease uh scandal I should say was just an escaped bioweapon and the government tried to cover it up but the medical industry figured it out and you know called them out on it and found a solution 
it seems like what has happened is that the medical industry, it's almost like, you know, that famous, uh, I think is Eisenhower with the military industrial complex, that there's the medical industrial complex now with the government. Um, and that was something that I think your book actually made much more clear to me than I had previously been uh, apparent, which is just that these two seemingly independent bodies move actually very hand in hand. Um, so I'd love to touch on that actually for the the Lyme disease story in, in particular. Uh, like, why didn't the medical industry, you know, as soon as, as you said, a scientist should be able to see that, hey, something doesn't make sense here and make some noise about it, write a paper about it. And it would sort of correct itself, right, over a sh- relatively short period of time if the official story didn't match the on the ground science. But that doesn't seem to be what happened here. Like it's taken decades and decades and it's still, you know, I would say not really very well known um, about this. So w- what caused that? And like, how has the medical industry played a role in in making that happen? So I covered this a little bit in the documentary Under Our Skin. But there, because this was a new organism, there was a very small group of researchers who jumped in on that. I call it the Oklahoma land rush, you know, trying to patent things. Then everybody else was locked out. Then, so so part of it was the government was okay in keeping a tight circle around who was researching it. And some of these people had security clearances because they didn't want people to look too closely at the other things in the tick. So that part is my opinion. Uh, the other part is... There's this kind of wagons are circled around certain diseases, and and we've seen this in Alzheimer's. There's a certain paradigm. This is not just Lyme disease, but for example, Alzheimer's. There's a the lead researchers have a certain hypothesis, and they um, share ideas with like-minded people, and they don't let the outside ideas in. So with Alzheimer's, so like the, the Louis body plaque sort of theory. And what we're seeing is that's dissolving now because the Louis bodies are just there to protect your brain from harms like germs and environmental toxins because your immune system can't get in there and clear it out. So that's falling apart now. But So there's this structural thing in the way NIH grants are awarded that can be gamed. So you have all these researchers, PhD, MDs, And they're the smartest people in the world. And of course, they're going to figure out how to game the grant system. (laughs) So I meticulously documented this in the film. Not all of it ended up in the film. A lot of it's on my website. But what happens... Yeah, we'll definitely link to the website in the the show notes for the episode so people can can dive in on on your website. Yep. Most of the conflicts of interest in the the research cabal are on document cloud. So I'll send you that too. Because there's charts and graphs and tables. But... Okay, so there are basically 12 main researchers, and they're all from different universities. And you can't give a a medical research grant to someone in your own lab or your university, but you can give it to someone in another university. So they had sentries in the grant review committees um, across universities, and they would trade grants. And then, oh, I got a grant for a clinical trial, and I'll let you be it a clinical trial site. So there's profit sharing and conflicts of interest, but they're very invisible. And I use the analogy of the mafia, you know, the mafia families, FBI spends all this time trying to track the relationships that are unpublished in there. So that's, that's really what happens. Same thing happens in the public, the journal publishing world. So these researchers are largely today, judged by how many publications they have and how cited they are. So if you have a buddy system, you can just totally jack up, you know, who gets published or what. So almost all the journals in that are on PubMed, which is the website where you publish findings, um, they all have volunteer editors, hmm. except for science and nature magazine, which are really high prestige. So if you can put, if you can have your buddies at the other university volunteer to be a volunteer editor for anything related to ticks, you can lock up what gets published and what gets blackballed. Because in these grant review committees, you have maybe 35 people. Um, 
in the initial review, you know, they have hundreds of grants they have to review. There's two specialists on assigned each paper. If you're the tick guy on clinical infectious diseases, uh, you can take these dissenting opinions, the minority reports, and totally blackball them, and they'll never see the light of day. So what we're seeing in 30 to 40 years is the minority report, which says what the patients say, these are really uh, complicated polyorganism infections when you get bitten by a tick. And oh, by the way, how this cabal is defining the disease, which is pretty much a rash, our vaccine gets rid of the rash and then the disease is away. You know, no, that's not true. Lyme disease can be chronic. There are a lot of reasons for that. Maybe it's a very virulent strain of the Lyme bacteria. Maybe it's mixed with infections, co-infections, other organisms that we're not checking for. Maybe even one of those engineered germs. But don't look. Don't look up. Don't look down into the tick. Right. Yeah. And so it seems like there's, I mean, the incentives are just totally able to be gamed by if somebody wants to sort of lock up the story and has the resources to do so, it's not all that difficult. Um, What about the, uh, there's another thing you highlight in the book where there's a cheap, you know, if, if somebody is found to have Lyme disease and they are treated effectively early on, they can be, I, I believe you said it's effect, like there's an effective treatment with cheap antibiotics uh, that would potentially, you know, uh, not require then this whole Lyme disease industrial complex uh, that's sort of developed around, around all of this. So it's, that's another, you know, profit incentive essentially for overcomplicating and making, you know, not basically patients not being actually the customer of this. Right. So 81, 82, there's a tale of two cities that I always use. AIDS was just the organism behind AIDS, HIV, HIV AIDS was discovered at the same time as Lyme disease. Uh, Lyme disease, the cure is fast treatment of an off patent antibiotic doxycycline, which when I was sick, it was like $10 at Walmart or Costco. AIDS, of course, is a virus. There, you can't use antibiotics on that. Oh, we can patent antivirals. So fast forward 40, 50 years, AIDS is now a manageable chronic disease because the incentives were there for pharma to take on that research. With Lyme disease, well, there's no money in that. Forget that. Let's let's work on a vaccine. I won't go into the problems of the vaccine. Read Cure Unknown by Pam Weintraub if you want to go down that rat hole. So that's that's we saw some parallels with the with COVID with that because there were some clinicians who said, "Hey, ivermectin works. Hydrochloroquine works. What about?" silver sprays in the nose. I mean, there were many opportunities to form study groups talking about prevention rather than waiting till people have to be intubated in the hospitals. But instead they put all their eggs in the vaccine basket. And uh, so they pretty much threw, they've thrown all the long COVID people under the bus. There's still no good treatment. My husband has long COVID, so... That's a sad story. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's uh it's funny because the people that were sh- not funny at all actually. It's extremely sad is like the people that were shouting the loudest about uh science were following the least scientific method process possible. Uh, I mean you would think that right it's it's in everyone's best interest to try a lot of things, right? Increase the the space of uh potential solutions and hopefully then you find you find some things that work. Uh, but instead it's like, it's very, it was very much, I mean, I, I think this was the case with, with COVID and it sounds like actually with Lyme as well, where it's a very top down, you know, we know best kind of situation. And that creates a lot of opportunities for, um, going down the wrong path and then just leaving, you know, again, it goes back to the patient is not really, um, the customer here. It's not what the incentives are, are, have created as the end goal. The end goal is not getting the patient better and improving their life. The end goal is like, how do we make some money out of this whole thing? (laughs) That's basically what it comes down to. Yeah. And so I worked at Stanford medical school for 10 years and 
every one of those people, I think, went into medicine for the right reason to heal people. But it's the incentive structure around them that forces them to behave in a way that um, they never imagined. So it's the insurance companies. So the insurance companies are like, oh, my gosh, we don't want, want to pay for these chronically ill people, the, the Lyme people, the chronic fatigue people, the long COVID people. So we'll just deny that the chronic disease even works. So that's another right. uh, incentive. And and in the case of Lyme disease, if you're a physician who prescribes long-term antibiotics, you get called into the principal's office in your institution. Oh, we have to worry wow. about um, like antibiotic resistance or, or antibiotic yeah. resistance because Medicare changed the rules and said, if your hospital is unclean and someone gets a super bug, you have to pay for that. <laughs> you know, so it's a lot of financial incentives that are handcuffing well-meaning physicians who just want to heal people. And I, my heart breaks, you know, when I hear the physician's stories and they hate the system as much as the patients do. But yeah, how do we it's break some... the cycle? How do we break it? I don't know. Right. I mean, it's, yeah, it, there's also compartmentalizing that's happening, I think, on the part of both the system and individual uh, physicians where you might just be working on one small little piece of all of this, right? And you don't necessarily, maybe you are capable of seeing how it fits into the big picture, but there's no reason, like, it, it's actually very uh, uncomfortable to to think about then where you're fitting into the big picture and what you're doing. So, you know, you're, the story you're telling yourself is, oh, I'm just you know, doing this little, this little bit of research, like how is that impacting this whole thing? And, you know, you have a plausible deniability basically as well. But I do agree. I mean, most, I mean, almost every person who goes into the field is well-meaning. It's just, it, it's well-meaning people thrown into a, a system that is not well-meaning or, or has not been set up to be well-meaning. Um, one thing you mentioned when we were uh, chatting before we started recording, which I definitely wanted to touch on is um, you, you said you have a theory that your book was potentially being suppressed, uh, in the early days after publication. I'd love to hear more about that. And then would also just love to hear like, how has the, um, reception been? I, like, I think you had a pretty major publisher pub publish the book. Um, but then how has the reception been since, you know, maybe, uh, the, I think it came out 2019. So over the last four, four years. Yeah. Harper Collins and the normal arc for a book is, you get most of your sales in the first year. Everybody picks it up and reviews it. Oh, this is a fascinating topic. Uh, but with mine, first of all, because of the sensitive nature of it, I knew that the powers that be would want to suppress it. We didn't send out a lot of advanced copies for reviews. So that allowed the NIH, I think, to throttle it in the beginning but I'll, I'll tell you how it rolled out. So I FOIA'd the response to my book in the NIH um, after it came out. So before there were any... So just to, uh, just to throw in something, just so people don't know what that means, Freedom of Information Act. So you can uh, petition the government to release information. Uh, and that that's what you mean by FOIA, right? Yeah. So I yeah. sent a request to NIH and said, hey, um, send me the emails... In the, at the NIH and the CDC of any time you mention me or my book. So when it was in production, no one had copies of the book. I, NIH was in a total freak out. Um, mostly they thought it was all lies because it's such a compartmentalized, confidential topic. Only the old timers knew about it. And so I, once the book came out, I, I could see reading between the lines of the emails, a collective rut row, Scooby Doo's rut row. Um, and then there was legal meetings and then there was dead silence from, from the public's public. point of view. And they thought, well, maybe we, this will just peter out or whatever. I suspect there were major media people that called the NIA, the NIH people and said, what do you think about this? And they probably said, Ugh, total lies. But then like an event happened that no one suspected. And that is Congressman Chris Smith from New Jersey, who has a huge tech, tech problem. He's there at ground zero, waved it in front of the DOD budget committee and said, Hey, this book bitten, it's really credible. This is highly disturbing that we were weaponizing insects. And I think we should add an amendment 
to the DOD budget, which is really small compared to <laughs> WMDs, um, to just declassify these these um, files on uh, weaponized insects because the lingering effects to the public health carry on since these bugs creep and the germs that they carry creep. So all of a sudden I became an international laughing stock because it just sounds so ridiculous. Weaponized ticks, that's just stupid. Um, but I think the NIH was ready and they just said lies, lies, lies. Fake news. It was in the middle of the fake news thing. Fine. Once people read it, it's like, well, yeah, this is very well researched and cited. Uh, but then what happened right after Chris Smith is a tick researcher at Tufts University published a, about a thousand word op-ed in the Washington Post that said this whole concept of weaponized ticks and limes and experiments on U.S. soil is conspiracy theory. And they linked to my book. They didn't mention my book, but they linked to my marketing page. So all of a sudden, he's a credible professor. He teaches biosecurity. It just killed the marketing in every way. Killed a film deal, killed maybe reviews, but people got around to reading it. I Yeah, it, <laughs> so I people came in with the idea that this is already, a, you know, this is theory. false. Yeah, so they wouldn't right. even pick up the book. And give it right. a chance to tell the story and, right. so, and have and, the you know, evidence it, stand on its own merit. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, e even in the Abed, it said, oh, jur Willie Bergdorfer was just playing with this journalist like a cat in a mouth, which is very anti-feminist fe anti in a way. Oh, this woman journalist. So I called, I immediately called the professor. Oh, Professor Telford. Uh, wow, there's some things that are incorrect. 15 things, by the way. Can we talk about it right now? He goes, oh, sure. And I said, oh, by the way, did you read the book? He says, no, I didn't read the book. I don't have time to read books. So to oh me, that, that says someone else probably drafted it, and it was probably the NIH. They won't release what they sent to Chris Smith, so I can't prove it. Um, but anyways, so now that – and they didn't – and Telford didn't disclose that he had major military industrial funding – for the biosecurity lab he was director of in Groton, Connecticut, Connecticut, including he's the world's leading researcher on tick-borne tularemia, which was weaponized. Uh, so anyways, the lies continue. Yeah. Um, it was a, I, you know, they didn't, he didn't disclose his conflicts. They didn't fact check it. I called the editor of the Washington Post and said, we don't fact check op-eds, which is completely false. So, <laughs> Um, this is what I'm saying is the conflicts run deep. They're not apparent to the public. I, I mean, the trajectory of my book now is once the Wuhan lies started rolling out, now it's popular because, you know, Lyme is the prequel to whatever happened in Wuhan. So it's, it's encouraging that the truth is coming out. You know, I, I, yeah, I was going to say African, it's, uh, I love the, old yeah, I was going to say it's now it. it's, uh, Oh, actually, I'd love to hear the proverb. Yeah, that I'll tell you. Yeah, so the African <laughs> proverb is, truth is like a lion. Let it loose and it can defend itself. So that's that's encouraging. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was going to say on on uh, the, the, the conspiracy theorists have a pretty decent track record over the past few years. So that that I think used to be like a nail in the coffin, you know, in the I would say five years ago or five plus years ago something was labeled a conspiracy theory. I mean, I think like what you had happened to, to your book, it's um, it was, it was a bad thing. And now it's like, there's actually been a lot of proven uh, conspiracy theories. And I think that's made, I, I would say at least just in general conversations with folks, it's like, that isn't quite a nail in the coffin. It's like, it's almost like fodder for, Oh, that could be interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm open to, to, you know, exploring that a little bit. Is that true in the scientific mainstream and the, the you know the the, the uh, mainstream media? Absolutely not. I don't think we've gotten there yet. But you know, at least on I would say with social media or certain circles in social media and just general population, the percentage of people who would be open to at least entertaining an idea like this um, and at least reading the book, right? And I, I would say to anybody listening, read read the book and judge for yourself. You know, everything is cited, linked to. Um, there was a lot of primary research done as part of this book as well. So 
it, it, it stands up on its own merits. I mean, I know, I mean, Chris, just to tell you, I was, when I first picked up the book, I was actually a little bit skeptical. You know, I'm on the same page with you on, on COVID. Like a lot of things happened there that were like, so I'm coming at it from the same background. Um, but I, with Lyme, I was just thinking, this is not a new disease. Like this thing has been around for a long time. Wouldn't these lies have come out by now, right? And wouldn't everybody know by this point? Uh, and how wrong I was actually by after reading that book. So uh, yeah, I would encourage anybody listening, if you're still skeptical after uh, listening to this and you're like, hey, I, I need to fact check this lady, like pick up the book, go to the website. I'm going to link to the website. I'll also link to, you said there was some... Uh, there's a set of documents that I can link to as well. Yes. So I'll give you my link to my docu- document cloud cache <laughs> of research that yep. went behind the documentary. Yep. Yeah. Cool. So, well, I mean, I'll link to all that in the in the show notes. Yep. Yeah. I'll just add one thing. And that is I read you know over 50 really boring bioweapons books. And the thing that sets my book apart, I think, is just... The, the interesting character of Willie Bergdorfer, who, like I was saying, started out with good intentions when he went into the research field and then he got sucked into the bioweapons program and like the mafia, then you can never leave. And so watching the, I got a lot of his personal letters. I looked at a lot of his personal letters. So it's the personal agony that you see as he goes along in his career. And finally he gets the chance of a lifetime to discover a major new organism, but it's compromised, it's tainted. And he knows that and how it tears him apart in the later part of his life. And then he talks to me and other filmmakers. And so he, he had a change of heart and then he got the, it's very karmic. He gets the disease that he helped cover up. (laughs) Yeah. I know. And I think the portrait of him was really interesting, too. I knew nothing about him before the the book, but just his background, how he, you know, uh, grew up um, and then, you know, the whole situation with his wife uh, and their, their children. Um, there's a lot there. I mean, it's a he is a very interesting character. So you had a, you had a good subject to uh, to write about, too. Yeah. Um, what are you what are you working on these days? Uh, I know you said you have another book coming out. Maybe we can tease that just a little and uh and then also maybe if you're working are you working on any other film projects at the moment um so bitten is um in development for a, a documentary and then i have another story that i wrote for stanford uh, about um a flea-borne disease it sounds boring but it's called swamp boy And that's being turned into a film. And Swamp Boy is really interesting because it's about a boy who is 14 years old. He all of a sudden comes on, has a sudden onset, what appears to be schizophrenia. He's thinking he's turning into Swamp Thing. His only friends are his Lego men. Uh, And it's about how his very courageous father uh, discovers that he has a flea-borne disease called cat scratch disease, Bartonella. And it's about... It's also about the history, just like I did the history of Lyme disease. It's a history of cat scratch disease, which took over a hundred years for us to understand. And now finally we're getting a good test for it. So it's a very dramatic father saving his son from being locked down forever in a psych ward. And so that's wow. being made into a film. And then my, I'm just doing another book um, about um, the Skull Valley nerve gas accident about Oh, the, the 6,000 yeah. sheep fall dead in the desert. What happens? Yeah, I think that's going to be, I mean, I only know about that from your book, from Bitten, and then uh, just a little bit of Googling. So I'm excited to read that one too, because that probably gets into the chemical weapons program, not yeah. just the biological weapons program. Yeah. But it's the cool. same. It's the same. Like, for some reason, the military has thought it's okay to develop a weapon that kills more Americans than enemies. So. <laughs> yeah. It's the same, same uh, fundamental thought process or flaw, a flawed thought process that led to both programs. Right. Um, where can people find you if they want to follow you and, and uh, stay up to date on these projects? So I have a website for Bitten. It's chrisnewby.com with K- KR. And then I have a sub stack where I'm, rolling out new 
findings on the Lyme disease um, mysteries. And then I have Twitter. So that's sort of my main channel, I would say, under Chris Newby. Great. I'll link to uh, to all of it uh, in the show notes. But um, Chris, this was a fascinating conversation. I uh, will continue recommending your book to anyone I can. And um, yeah, appreciate you joining me today. Great, great question. So uh, thanks for doing the deep dive on the book because a lot of interviewers don't. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was my pleasure, actually. I uh, I really enjoyed it. It was one of those books you're like disappointed when you're you're done. You're like, I want to keep keep going, um, but it was it was it was just eye opening in a lot of ways. I mean, I personally have not been affected to you know knock on wood uh, yet by uh, by you know by Lyme disease, but I know a lot of people have. And I mean, everything you mentioned on the personal story, it's just I, that's exactly what I hear from people that I know who've been affected by this. It's like. It was like not exactly your experience, but the frustration, the you know, the the sort of gaslighting by the medical industry, like all of that was so familiar to me. Um, and so, yeah, it was just I, I like how you sort of threaded the needle between scientific history and personal story and almost biography as well with uh, Willie Bergdorfer. So, yeah, it's really well written. Yeah, I, I like us. Uh medical mysteries a lot so that's a theme <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> you made a career of it <laughs> yeah. cool well i appreciate it chris uh, i'll uh, i'll link to all those resources in the in the show notes and um yeah appreciate you taking the time well thanks neil